And tonight we will hear about coral reefs, one of the most iconic, diverse and threatened ecosystems on Earth. Yet the deeper portions of this habitat, which correspond to almost two thirds of the environment, remain largely unexplored. So this evening we'll learn more about these deep reefs from Louise Rocha. Louise is the Follett Chair of Ichthyology and Co-Director of the Hope for Reefs Initiative at the California Academy of Sciences. He's published over 170 peer-reviewed articles, two books, and his work is featured in many popular media outlets. And his main current area of work involves the exploration and conservation of little known deep coral reefs throughout the tropics. He leads a team of highly trained and experienced scientists and technical rebreather divers that are comprehensively exploring and conserving these deeper reefs for the first time. And so this evening, we're going to hear more about the program that he has created um, and hear some of the stories behind uh, their most spectacular discoveries. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this this evening, uh, Louise. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, this is one of the oldest scientific societies in the world. Uh, very, very prestigious. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, and the subject is coral reefs, yeah. But before I go deep, I want to start uh, with a, a brief introduction, talking a little bit more about shallow coral reefs, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, so as most of you know, um, shallow reefs are very brightly lit, very beautiful, very diverse ecosystems. They are the most diverse marine ecosystem in the planet. Um, they are so diverse that about a third of all species of marine fish live only in coral reefs, um, and that diversity is very uh, disproportional to their area. So in terms of area, they're very small. They require very specific uh, environmental conditions to, to be able to exist. Uh, they require a brightly lit um, ecosystem, um, so the water has to be clear. There's a lot of sun that has to be reaching the reef in order for it to, to thrive. Um, it has to be shallow water, um, it has to have a hard substratum, so with all of those conditions there's very few places where you find coral reefs, and the result of that is that uh, you find them in less than 0.1% of the surface of the ocean, yet they are home to about a third of all marine fish species, a third of all crustaceans, all of the corals are on in coral reef, um, so a very disproportionately high diverse uh, ecosystem. And one of the things that really drives me on my research is trying to understand why and how there's so many species that can coexist uh, coexist together. Um, something else that a lot of people know about coral reefs is that they are declining. Uh, they're declining throughout the world for a number of different reasons, uh, both local and uh, uh, regional and global uh, ecosystem level kind of impacts are affecting them. Everything from overfishing to, to pollution, to physical destruction, to sedimentation, to uh, uh, sewage runoff that increases the nutrients and causes the algae to uh, uh, overgrow the coral and outcompete the coral. Um, but the largest uh, uh, threat today is uh, one that is global in nature. So this picture I took uh, of one of my colleagues here at the California Academy, Bart Shepard, he's the director of the aquarium and he does a lot of those trips together with me. Um, I took off Bart looking at a perfectly healthy reef in French Polynesia, it was, it was early 2019. Uh, we were there for an expedition and I'm, I'm gonna get to that subject in a little bit, uh, but uh, uh, not we do not only do the science here, but we also collect live specimens for our exhibits. So the, at the California Academy of Sciences, the place that I work uh, here, um, we have a natural history museum with tens of millions of specimens, but we also have a living collection, an aquarium, and sometimes we bring live specimens back. So we did two expeditions to uh, French Polynesia. The first one, this the objective was just to collect specimens for the natural history collection. That's what we were doing here. That was in um, April of 2019. And then six weeks later, we came back to the same place and this is what we found. Um, so coral reefs, one of the reasons why they require light is because there's a zooxanthellae an alga that lives inside the coral reef that provides nutrition to the reef. So it's a really 
interesting and really tight symbiotic relationship. The alga, which depends on light, uses the light from the sun. So the corals, they live in brightly lit, shallow ecosystems with clear water. The, the algae look, uses the, the light from the sun to convert food into, into energy for itself, and then it refuses uh, its, its waste is used by the corals as nutrients. So it's a recycling system. The corals uses the waste from the algae. The algae uses the waste from the coral. And then one depends on the other. That's a symbiotic uh, relationship when both species depend on each other. Now, this, this relationship is so tight, so linked, so tightly linked um, that it's very highly susceptible to any variances in environmental conditions. And when the water temperature goes up, the corals, they get so stressed that they expel the algae within their tissue. And this is what's happening here. So all of these white corals, and go back to the other picture again, everything is nice and colorful here. All of the, the things that give the brown color to the, to the coral is the algae that lives within their tissue. All of these whites that you're seeing here is corals that are bleaching. So they're expelling the alga because they're too stressed because the water is, so, is too warm. So this is happening at a global level. This was in French Polynesia, but it happens in many, many other places around the world in the Great Barrier Reef. And this is uh, the biggest threat uh, for coral reefs at the moment. Um, now, the problem here is that almost everything we know about corals and coral reefs comes from science that we did in shallow waters. And very little is known about the bottom two thirds of of coral reefs. So the deeper you go in a reef, the less you know about it. Um, we know quite a bit about the top 50 meters or so, that's 200 feet, so about 50 to 60 meters. That's the area that is accessible to recreational scuba divers. So if you're a scientist and you want to explore the coral reef by diving, um, it's, it's as simple as getting an open water diving certification, which is the most basic certification you can get, putting a tank in your back and then go diving. And that's what you see on TV. Usually people breathing in and out of a tank and then bubbles come out. Um, that's the normal recreational diving way for diving. That's very easy to do. Um, you, want, you learn it once, you can do it safely. You can do it safely with your students. You can do it safely with colleagues. So that's why we know so much about shallow reefs because it's highly accessible to recreational scuba divers. Uh, the, area that I really I'm really interested in is this this next area here that we commonly call um, the twilight zone um, and that's uh, also known as a mesophotic coral ecosystem so it's mesophotic because that that means middle light so the top portion of the reef is brightly lit below 150 meters or so it's quite dark there's just some light there that you can measure by instruments but it's it's very very dark it to the human eye it looks like night and, and in between there's this area um, that we call mesophotic coral ecosystem that's the middle light area where there's some light but not a lot I call it twilight zone because it feels like when you're diving during twilight hours so if you're there to dive in a shallow reef uh, just before sunset or after sunrise uh, that's what you'd see like a, a dimly lit kind of area with not a lot of light. Now that's what the twilight zone looks like. That's what mesophotic coral ecosystems look like to me. Uh, now, because they're harder to reach, they're impossible to reach by recreational scuba divers, it's very hard to explore. A lot of people ask me about submarines. So why don't you explore that area with submarines? Um, submarines, there's a few drawbacks to studying mesophotic ecosystems with submarines. One is that they're very expensive. And by that, I mean tens of thousands of dollars per day to operate, uh, plus the cost of the ship that you have to put the, the, the platform that you have to put the submarine in. Um, but also they're very large, very noisy, very brightly lit. There's a lot of lights. Um, so it's very hard to study fish with them. Trying to study fish in a, a reef system like a mesophotic coral ecosystem with a submarine it's almost like trying to study birds in a rainforest with a helicopter. So you get close to the reef with very big, very noisy kind of equipment, lots of lights in, the, all, the, all of the fish are gonna swim away. You still see the coral, you still, still you see the ecosystem, but you can't see the fish, which is what I am really interested in. So to me, there was no question, I really wanted to explore this region using diving and not, uh, and not submarines. Uh, now, the problem is that um, if you're a diver, you know that the deeper you go, the more complex things get. 
uh, the more gear you have to take, the more gas you have to take, and uh, it becomes really quickly very impractical to do any science when you have this much gear attached to yourself. So if you want to do a uh, uh, dive into those depths between oh, above 60 meters and between 60 and 120, 150 meters or so, you can't breathe air. Uh, you have to breathe a different mix of gas. So the atmosphere is mostly oxygen and nitrogen. Those two gases, they become toxic and narcotic the deeper you go. So if you breathe them under pressure, even though they're perfectly fine to breathe here at one atmosphere, the deeper you go, the more the pressure there is because of the water column above your head. And if you breathe them deeper, they become narcotic and toxic. So nitrogen gives you a narcotic effect. Uh, if you're breathing nitrogen below 30 meters, you almost feel like you're drinking alcohol. So it's the feeling of one glass of alcohol per atmosphere, uh, one glass of wine every 10 meters or so. And if you're at 120 meters, it's the equivalent of drinking a whole bottle of chew of wine, uh, the effect. So you don't want to be at 120, 130 meters drunk and trying to manage all of this equipment. Um, and then oxygen becomes toxic. Um, you can't breathe oxygen deeper than 60 meters or so because it causes you to pass out and you don't want to pass out underwater. So we replace those gases with helium. Helium is what we call an inert gas. It doesn't have any physiological interactions with your body, even when you dive deep, breathing it. So we remove some of the nitrogen, remove some of the oxygen, and add helium. And we breathe a mix that we call trimix, because it's mainly three gases, helium, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, at the depths we go to, it's mostly helium. We remove more, more most of the oxygen and, and most of the um, uh, nitrogen. And the problem here is that helium is very expensive. Um, so if you look at this diver here on the right side photo, there's bubbles coming out. So right, if you ever saw a, a documentary about diving, every time you breathe in with a regulator and you breathe out, bubbles come out. Um, when you're breathing air from a tank, that's not a problem because air is very cheap, but helium is very expensive. And at 100 meters, every time you exhale from one of those tanks, that costs $10 in helium. So you don't want to be spending that much in helium in every, every dive you do. So the answer to, to those two questions, how do you take less equipment and you're still able to do, to do uh, the diving and how do you save on helium is using the rebreather. And the rebreather is the equipment we use uh, to go to those depths. Now the rebreather has brings a lot of advantages to dive into those depths. I'm gonna try to give you a crash course here on, on what means to dive on a rebreather. So when you're diving on open circuit, when you're diving with a regular scuba tank, when you inhale that, that air, the gas comes out of the tank and then you inhale and then we exhale and comes out as bubbles. With the rebreather, re when you exhale, as the number says, as the name says, you rebreathe the same gas over and over again. So when you exhale, instead of the air or gas comes out as coming out as bubbles, it goes back into the system. There's a filter, a canister on the back of the diver that removes the CO2 chemically. And then there's electronic sensors that monitor the, the amount of oxygen and add the oxygen, only the oxygen you need. And then that mixture comes back and you breathe that again. So you rebreathe the same mixture again and again, minus the CO2 plus the oxygen that you need. So not only that makes the whole equipment much more efficient than uh, the open circuit equipment, because you don't need all of those tanks, you don't need that much gas, but also what you don't see in this diagram here is helium. And that's because the helium, nothing happens to it. It's an ignorant gas. So you're breathing basically the same helium over and over again and just removing the CO2 and adding the oxygen. So that makes the entire operation a lot, a lot cheaper uh, because you're not exhaling $10 worth of helium every time you exhale. You're just breathing the same helium over and over again, minus carbon dioxide plus the oxygen that you need. So when we started doing those dives to those depths, because of everything going on in shallow reefs, one of the first questions we wanted to ask, well, we wanted an answer for, was are those deep reefs a refuge? Um, so there's a lot of scientific literature there dating back 20 or 30 years that says that um, a lot of the impacts that we're seeing on those shallow reefs are not reaching the deep reefs, and deep reefs might work as a refuge to animals, to organisms that live and are so much so uh, very threatened in the shallow reefs. Um, all of those 
hypotheses, all and the that entire uh, line of thinking is based on these two assumptions. One, that there is a high overlap between shallow and deep species, and two, that the deep reefs are out of reach from human impacts. So if those two assumptions are met, then yes, the deep reefs are an ecosystem level refuge to the shallow reefs. If they aren't, then we have a problem. So we wanted to test those two assumptions there. And the first one, I put numbers in there. So everybody assumed there was a high of six, between 69 to 77% overlap between shallow and deep communities because everyone was looking at it using depth ranges. So a depth range is a number that we attach to every species. So you say you have a, a species of fish, I don't know, you can think of anything you, you like, maybe a cod. The depth range of that species is from 30 to 200 meters. That's the documented depth range in a database that you look at online. Now that depth range does not equal to the actual depth where that species usually lives. That only means that that species was collected between 20 and 200 meters. Now, if that depth range includes both shallow and deep reef, that species would be automatically added to the, the, the column that says that it's a shallow species that depends on the deep reef, or that can find refuge in the deep reef. Now, the more we looked at this, the more we saw what is not the case. And the, the second one too uh, was the, the, the same thing. The more we looked at the deep reefs, the more impact we saw it. Now, how did we get to that? Uh, so to, to untangle that range from what, where the, the, the species actually live, we counted over 100,000 fish in, in many different locations throughout the world. Um, we used transect counts. So that one on the left there is Hudson Pinheiro. He was uh, my PhD student here at my lab and a postdoc, and now he is uh, in Brazil in uh, Sao Paulo State at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, working at their marine station there. And uh, we're still continue working together. We just published a nice paper together uh, last week. But I did this picture I took off Hudson at about 135, 140 meters depth in Ponape conducting a transect. So a transect is, is a line, a measured line that we lay along the reef. And then we count every fish along that line, one meter to each side of the line. And we do that repeatedly along every depth we can, we can stop at. So we start deep and then at the shallower we go, the more counts we do. And then we add that all up in a database and we ended up with this database with over 100,000 fish in it. And the conclusion that we got from this massive database was very different from what, we, what people expected, people assumed based on just the species depth ranges. So instead of that 69 to 77% overlap, what we saw was these numbers here are dissimilarity. So what we saw was that the, the shallow reef was 87 to 96% dissimilar. So 87 to 96% different than the deep reef. So even though there are species that can spam a really long, really large depth range, most of them don't. They have their preferred depth range and they don't stray out of it unless there's some other circumstance that, that pushes them to, to do it. For example, there's a lot of species that uh, are on the deep reef because they like the cold water in the deep reef. So if the shallow reef is also cold water, they might be find shallow, found shallow too. But the deep reef, the reefs that are really suffering, the human impacts are the ones that are in warm water. So that species is really not a shallow warm water species that finds refuge in the deep reef. It's really a, a species that likes cold water and is only found in deep reefs in cold water. So one of the first discoveries we made was this one. This paper is published, and I can put at the end of the paper, at the presentation, I'll put a, a link in the chat to the several papers we published about this subject. And in this one, we really saw that uh, there's almost no overlap in communities between shallow and deep reefs. Yes, some species still occur throughout the depth range. For example, sharks, they swim up and down between deep and shallow reef, but most species, by and large, the community in general, is very different from deep and shallow reef. Now, the more we looked at uh, those deeper reefs, the more we found new things. And by new things, I mean like really, really new things. Uh, we started finding new species. So this is just a few of the new species we found in the past uh, 10, 15 years where we've been really focusing on, on uh, uh, studying those deep reefs. Most of them have names, uh, others don't. And by uh, uh, talking about names, 
uh, one of the things we started doing recently too is, is having fun and, and trying to make taxonomy in general more inclusive. So we really started uh, changing the way we do taxonomy. So classically, uh, taxonomy uh, is done using scientific names and the scientific names are usually Latin or Greek. And uh, historically and, and traditionally, this was done because back 200 years ago when taxonomy started almost 300 years ago, actually, um, scientists from different locations didn't have access to uh, uh, other languages. If you if you were someone in the U.S., it was very hard to to read something in in, in German back 200 years ago, and else you had like a really good education. But a language that everybody learned was Latin, and somebody and a lot of the academics, especially in the academic world, had a lot of Greek. Uh, uh, rudimentary learning. So a lot of the names are either Latin or Greek. Um, nowadays, with the internet, we don't need that anymore. All the scientists can communicate easily using English or Google Translate or, or something like that. So what we started doing with our species name is we put we started putting scientific names using local names from the places where we describe the species. So for example, Luzonictis Kiomeamea is a species we found in Easter Island, and Kiomeamea is a Rapa Nui name. So we're putting like local names in local species. Chromix Gunting. Gunting is a Filipino name. That species is from the Philippines. And that's really raising the bar in terms of interest um, uh, as far as local uh, community gets uh, engaging with those species. When they see the species from their local community that has a name that they know what it means, it means a lot more to them than just a, a new species from uh, a, a reef that they might not even know where it is. Um, so having fun with having fun with taxonomy and at the same time trying to make it more inclusive. Um, so in addition to the taxonomy and to understanding how the, the two uh, areas relate to each other, we started asking, and this is the paper that I just mentioned that we published a couple of weeks ago with Hudson, we started asking big, bigger questions about uh, uh, communities in general and how species are distributed in those deep reefs versus the shallow reefs. So there's a very well-known observation in shallow reefs uh, that's called the uh, uh, biodiversity gradient. So if you look at how species are distributed along uh, the planet in coral reefs, there's always areas that are more diverse and areas that are less diverse. But that diversity is distributed in a very predictable and very interesting way. It's more diverse in what we call the center of diversity. So if you look at that map there, the red circles represent higher diversity. So the warmer colors are higher diversities and the, the, the smaller cold colors, the blues are lower, lower diversity. So it's not just a random assortment of diversity. The farther you are from that, center of diversity, which in the case of coral reefs is always the Indonesian and the Philippines region. So what the region, what we call the coral triangle is always higher diversity. And doesn't matter what organism you're looking at for the fish, that's the case for corals. That's the case for crustaceans, that's the case for mollusks, that's the case. Every species that live in a coral reef, every major animal group and algae group actually also that live in a coral reef, they display this pattern, this gradient of biodiversity from the center, from the coral triangle, from the Philippines and Indonesia towards the periphery. In this case, in the Pacific, it's Hawaii and uh, uh, French Polynesia there on the bottom in the close of the Atlantic. The, the center of diversity is the Caribbean and the fringe is Brazil and the South Atlantic. So the further you are from the center of diversity, the less diversity there is and there's a gradient. If you're halfway, there's halfway diversity between the center and the periphery. Um, now, this, this is a very well-known uh, fact that was observed in many groups by many different biologists. Um, it holds true for mo all of the major groups that are found in the coral reef. Um, but all of these observations, again, going back to the beginning of the talk, they were made, remember, by scientists that were looking at only the shallow reef. Nobody has looked at this before uh, from a, a deeper reef perspective. So we did that using that same data set with uh, over 100,000 fish counted. And what we noticed was something really cool was that the deeper you go, the more this diversity gradient is attenuated. So this, this center portion there is the diversity gradient at about 60 meters depth. 
and the bottom is the diversity gradient at about 120 meters depth. So if you look at it, the, the, the deeper you go along the, the depth axis, the less apparent that diversity gradient becomes. And that the more uh, uh, every, the more the smaller the geographic scale is, the more evident that becomes. So if at the transect level, there's no diversity gradient whatsoever. In other words, uh, in the Philippines, in the shallow reef, you might count 50, 60 species in a transect. When you go to Hawaii, where it's in the periphery, you count 10, 15 species in a transect. So there's a huge difference in diversity in how, in, in, to how many species you count in a transect because it's higher regional diversity in the Philippines. It's higher regional, it's lower regional diversity in Hawaii. So it's higher transect diversity in the Philippines. It's lower transect diversity in Hawaii. The deeper you go, the less difference there is. So the point where at 120 meters, we see five, six species in a transect in the Philippines. And we also see five, six species in a transect in Hawaii. So that, that diversity gradient disappears the deeper you go. And the smaller the spatial scale, the more quickly that diversity gradient disappears. On the right there, it's just the same information conveyed in a in slightly different way. It's the breakdown in relationship between regional level diversity and local level diversity. And that paper is the one we published recently in Current Biology. I can put a link to it when we uh, um, uh, when we, we finish the talk. I'll put a link to it in the in the chat there. So one of the first things we saw again was that those deep communities were highly dissimilar from the shallow communities, so dissimilar that they even seem to follow different biogeographic rules. So this biogeographic rule that governs the shallow coral reefs that says that there's high diversity in the center and low diversity in the periphery, it seems to break down the deeper you go. Even at the higher geographic scale, when you look at the whole planet like this, the deep reefs seem to be different than the shallow reefs. So we have it established. It's different community. It's a different biogeography, even um, a very different species, all full of novelty, lots of new species. What about the, the second assumptions that the, the, the deep reefs are really out of reach from humans? So this is a photo I took in the Bahamas in an expedition we did there. Uh, it was one of the first expeditions we did to explore and understand this in deep reefs. Uh, that was back in 2016, I think. And um, we almost had to cancel that expedition because two weeks before the, the, the expedition, we were aboard a ship. And two weeks before, we got a call from the captain saying there's a, a hurricane coming to the Bahamas. And uh, it's going to hit the Bahamas. It's right on the path of the cruise we're going to do. So I don't think we, we can do the cruise because of the, because of the hurricane. And we were like, no, 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 nobody has ever looked at a reef, at a deep reef right after a hurricane. We have to, we have to do that. So we pushed the, the trip by just one day and we slightly adjust, adjusted the, the route to start behind the hurricane. So we basically followed the path of the hurricane, but behind the hurricane, not ahead of it. So we never met the hurricane. So we were safe from the hurricane, but we saw the impacts of the hurricane on the deep reef almost immediately after it passed. And it was the first time that was done before, um, since. And um, uh, what was really interesting is that everybody assumed that hurricanes, they only had a big impact in shallow reefs because that's what you see, right? When a hurricane comes by, one of the most destructive effects it has on shallow reefs is waves. So the hurricane causes a lot of big waves to come in and uh, those big waves, they break corals in the shallow reefs, they overturn corals, they, they, they cause mayhem in shallow reefs. Now, because those waves are restricted to shallow reefs, um, most scientists assume that the deeper you go, the safer you are from the effects of the hurricane. What we saw, this picture I took at about 120 meters depth, and normally a deep reef doesn't look like that. It's much more colorful than this. The reason why this is not colorful is because it's completely covered in sand. And the reason why it's completely covered in sand is because the, the hurricane, when it passed through the shallow reef, it steered up all of the sand from the shallow reef. And that sand rained, it, it smothered, it cascaded over the deep reef and covered everything in it, sponges, gorgonians, corals. So it really had a big impact in the deep reef. So the natural uh, events like hurricanes that uh, we thought were only affecting shallow reefs, in reality, they're also affecting the deep reefs. 
Uh, we saw a lot of other, in, in different expeditions to different places, we saw a lot of other impacts, coral diseases that people thought that uh, uh, were only impacting shallow reefs, turns out they're also impacting deep reefs. Um, they're being impacted by, they're being broken by uh, higher, stronger currents uh, uh, when the currents change uh, for whatever reason in, in a location, for example, because of a hurricane. Uh, or if anything from the shallow reef falls above on top of them, it breaks them. So they are suffering with um, almost every impact that is reaching shallow reefs is also reaching the deep reefs. This is one of the, the deepest pictures I took, uh, underwater pictures. This is a picture I took in the Philippines at about 148 meters depth. And this is one of those decorator sea urchins that uh, when it lives in a, in a seagrass bed, it covers itself in seagrass to camouflage itself so that the other predators don't see it. Um, here, this one is hanging onto a fishing line and it, this, this blue thing that is attached to it is a piece of plastic. So it's camouflaging itself with whatever it could find closest to it, which is in this case, a piece of plastic. So it really drives down the point that those deeper reefs, even 148 meters depth, in this case, it's a reef that nobody had ever seen before. This was the first time a human was, was seeing it. And the first picture anybody took of it, and then it's like plastics and, and fishing lines at 148 meters depth, a depth that everybody assumed was completely safe from human impacts. It really isn't. So we have another paper that hasn't come out yet. This is unpublished data. Uh, it's about to come out in about a month or so. Um, and um, uh, we did, so in the same transects we used to count fish, we also counted plastics. And uh, uh, surprisingly enough, in most locations we've been to, we found more plastics and more trash in deeper reefs than in shallow reefs. So the top image there, the dark blue, the dark uh, green blue um, represents the trash that we counted in deeper reefs in the light blue in shallow reefs. And it shows that in most locations, we found more trash, more fishing lines, more nets, more anchors, more anchor lines on deeper reefs than on shallow reefs. And the bottom one shows that most of the trash we found is fisheries related. So we found a lot of fishing line in deep reefs. And that's probably because there's two things that are going on in shallow reefs. They're either being protected, which is really nice, but that pushes the fishermen out of the shallow reefs or they're being depleted, they're being overfished. But in either case, what happens is if there's no fish for, their, for the fishermen there, or if they can't fish there, they, they'll fish in the next available habitat, which invariably is the deep reef. So when they go to the deep reef, the, the, the lines get tangled and they, they break and they break the, the deeper reefs. The, those kind, the kind of fishing, fishing line that breaks corals um, it can be even more damaging to deep reefs than it is to shallow reefs because corals in deep reefs in general, they, they take a lot longer to grow. It's a lower energy habitat. Uh, there's less light. The, there's no symbiotic relationship. Uh, there's very few symbiotic corals down there. Mostly are heterotrophic, so they, they use nutrients they find in the water as opposed to the sunlight, where, uh, dri which drives the, the shallow reef. But in general, shallow reefs, they grow much faster than, than deep reefs. Um, so they can compensate for the destruction caused by fisheries much quicker than deep reefs are. So in, in some ways, the damage caused by plastics and fishing lines and things like that on deep reefs is even bigger than on shallow reefs. So I want to tell you a story of a, 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 an expedition that we did in June 2017 to St. Paul's Rocks. St. Paul's Rocks is a tiny island off of Brazil. Um, Charles Darwin stopped there and spent some time there in his trip. It wasn't his first stops when he left London. It's in the middle of the Atlantic between uh, 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 Brazil and Africa. So it's about a third of the way for, uh, uh, between Brazil and Africa. Um, it's about a thousand miles from Brazil and 2000 miles from, or a, a thousand kilometers from Brazil and 2000 kilometers from Africa. A tiny little island. The only building in the island is this building there that you see in the picture. It's a research station for four scientists. Uh, it's usually occupied by scientists. Sometimes it's the military. Um, but regardless, it's probably the smallest human impact you can find in any, any island. There's no support for diving. So we had to go there uh, with a, a, a different kind of platform. Uh, we used this ship called the Alusha 
there was a decompression chamber on board. There was all of the support that we needed for the diving. We had all the helium there. We filled out all of the tanks on the ship. So we had to have this kind of support because it was not present in the island. The island itself is very small. So I took this picture from the highest point in the island. If I were to turn around and turn the, and take the picture facing the other way, it would be just ocean. So it's a, a very small island, just about 150 meters across by 150 by 100 meters. So very, very small, one building, four people. We had to be there on a ship. When we got there, we did our, our, our usual science. So that's Hudson again doing a transect count. Um, um, and um, I'm going to show you a video here of one of our dives. So this is um, the second dive we did there. And if you have your sound, maybe raise your sound a little bit because there's sound in this video and that it's it's relevant to it too. So I'm going to click play here and I'll stop at some points during the video to explain what's going on. So that's uh, the person that's filming is Mauritius Bell. He's the dive safety officer here at the Cal Academy. And that's the dive computer that's connected to our rebreather. So it shows us all of the information related to the, the rebreather. Uh, the first number I want you to look at is the depth. That's the top uh, uh, left corner of the computer there. 419 is the depth in feet. So that's about 115, 120 meters. Um, that we are 15 minutes into the dive. 150 feet is the first stop, and we'll have to stop there for one minute. Those three numbers there, 1.20, 1.23, and 1.21, they're the amount of oxygen that we're breathing. So that's what the rebreather does. Those three electronic sensors, they monitor the amount of oxygen. And when it goes below 1.2, they activate the unit to add more oxygen. So they add a little bit of oxygen. Uh, and this number here on the bottom right corner, TTS, is time to surface. So if we ended the dive there at 15 minutes into the dive, it would take us 83 minutes to come back to the surface. So when we dive at those depths, there's so much gas that gets absorbed into our body that uh, we can't go back straight to the surface. We have to go back very slowly and we have to stop every three meters when we get to a certain depth. In this case, 150 feet, uh, that's uh, what, 30, 35 meters. Uh, we have to stop every five, every three meters after that and then spend some time there. And the computer tells us there's an algorithm there that, that tells us how long it's going to take to come up and, and how long it's going to take to to for those gases that we absorb at depth to be eliminated from the body in a way that they don't turn into bubbles. We don't want to come. If we come back fast, that gas turns into bubbles, just like when you open a soda bottle, it's under pressure. If you open it very quickly, the gas in there turns into bubbles. So we have to come up really slowly so that the gas doesn't turn into bubbles. We don't have we want to have gas into our, our bloodstream. So that's what the information is in that uh, in that rebreather there. Uh, the, there's uh, another piece that's interesting in there, that O2 slash helium, that's the percentage of oxygen and helium that we're breathing. So 0.9, 9% oxygen, 73% helium. That's the mix of gas that we're breathing. And then the reminder is nitrogen. So that's about 15% nitrogen there. Um, that's what we need to be able to safely breathe at those depths at 120 meters or so. So I'm going to let the video go here and then I'll pause again in a little bit. And you hear Mauritius saying words, trying to get my attention, basically. So that's me there. I'm trying to catch a fish. So he's trying to sh show me to uh, get me to look at the shark, and I'm so distracted with the fish that I'm I'm not even understanding what he's saying. He's saying, "Look at the shark! Look at the shark!" And I'm thinking, "Let's go up! Let's go up!" I'm like, "No, I'm okay. I'm 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 taking catching a fish here. I don't want to look at the shark. I'm okay. I'm okay." And then the shark comes around. So he's like, "Luis, Luis, look at the shark. That's Hudson there." He's saying, Hudson. So Hudson looks at him and says, I'm okay. I'm catching a fish. So I'm going to pause here again. Um, uh, the, the, his voice sounds like that because of the helium. 
So when we breathe helium, uh, the, the, it passes through our vocal cords faster than air because it's a very light molecule. And our, our sound of our voice sound, sounds higher, higher pitch. So he's like, look at the shark, look at the shark, look at the shark. Um, now, um, th this really exemplifies uh, the, the two things that I just talked about. One, that those deep reefs are very different, and two, that they're already impacted. Uh, this species of shark is a six gill shark, so it's a species of shark that nobody ever sees in the tropics. This island is on the equator. St. Paul's Rocks is on the equator, so it's very much a tropical island. But we're so deep that we're below the tropical water. The water uh, where we are here is at about 13 degrees Celsius. The surface is 28, so we're in a different water mass altogether. And this fish, this, this shark, it likes cold water. So it's a shark that no diver has ever seen, probably. We were the only, the only people to see that shark. And if you pay attention there, below its spectral fin, that line coming out of its mouth, it's a fishing line. So it was probably hooked by a fishing by a fisherman at some point, and the, the, the shark was so big that the line broke, but the line is still attached to, to its mouth there. So it's a fish that nobody has ever seen before. The individual fish, we know what the species is. It's a fish that nobody has ever seen before. And uh, it's already been hooked by a line and it's being uh, not pulled up to the surface, but nonetheless, it's been, it had its encounter with humans before. So the only person that saw that shark was Meridius. <laughs> Neither Hudson nor I saw the shark. Um, because we were distracted catching a fish. There's the two of us there catching a fish. And this is the fish we were catching. So when you're catching a fish like that, how I mean you, you can understand perfectly why you, you ignore that shark. So that was uh, another kind of fun with taxonomy we had. Um, we named it Tosanoides aphrodite. So the genus is Tosanoides, and we named it aphrodite because it was so pretty that it made us ignore the shark. And it was um, um, it was really picked up by the media. So a lot of media outlets shared the news of this fish discovery. And it was interesting that about half of the news were about how pretty the fish was. And then the other half were about how we ignored the shark because we were catching this incredibly beautiful fish. Um, and like what it's this is one of the most mixed emotions I have every time I dive to those, every single time I dive to those depths, is we find fish like this, and then we turn around and we find this. So this is on the same dive that we found those fish, we find these pieces of trash all over the reef. Uh, and this is in an island that's a thousand kilometers from Brazil and has one building, one research station for four scientists. And then we find this much trash in it, in, in an in a ecosystem that nobody has ever seen before, in a, in a place that uh, it, it, it was the, the only time that anybody dove that deep there was uh, uh, when we did those surveys there. So we find that the spectacular new species that nobody has ever seen before, and you turn around and you find a piece of trash, a human impact, a piece of rope in that case, uh, some clothing that I don't even know what it is. So even when we go to the most remote locations, um, the deepest reefs, um, we find uh, human impacts everywhere. Now, the really worrying thing to me about that is that a lot of those deep reefs are unprotected. Uh, so this is uh, another place in Brazil. This is the island of Fernando de Noronha. Um, and uh, it has, I think, the best marine protected area in Brazil. It's one of the old, one of the first marine parks to be enacted in Brazil. Uh, it covers almost all of the reef area of the island. Uh, the blue line there it represents the borders of the park, um, but it is limited. It stops at about 50 meters depth, and anything deeper than 50 meters is not protected, So, which means most of the fishing in this island happens, almost all of the fishing happens on those deeper reefs. Um, and people are fishing everything there. They're having impacts there, and for the most part, we don't even know what is there. So um, one of the things that we're really focusing on lately is um, conservation of those deep reefs, uh, specifically because of this, because people know about the shallow reefs, they protect the shallow reefs, but they don't know about the deep reefs, so they don't protect the deep reefs. 
Um, so protecting a shallow reef is relatively, well, compared to protecting a deep reef, it's relatively easy because it's like those spectacular ecosystems. You can find pictures of them everywhere. Uh, you can find videos, you can find, you can dive, they're easy accessible. Even if you have just mask and snorkel, you don't have to go even scuba diving to, to see a, a shallow reef. Um, so in general, they are relatively uh, uh, easy to convince people to, to protect them. Deep reefs are, are very different because they look like this to the majority of the public. It's, it's inaccessible. Uh, we don't know what's there. It's like this black box that's hidden and, and, and unknown. And because people protect what they love and they they don't love those deep reefs because they don't know what they are, um, they don't protect them. In general, they don't protect them. Uh, most marine protected areas don't include deep reefs unless they're very, very large. Uh, the ones most marine protected areas uh, created on reefs are specifically to protect certain reefs and they don't usually include the deep reefs. So as I mentioned before, we're, we're having the, the fun with taxonomy. This is the one that uh, we, um, recently described from the Maldives. It was just about a year ago, and it also got a lot of media attention, again, because the fish is spectacularly beautiful. Um, but also, we gave it a Maldivian name. So the, the name there, Finifemna, is the same name. Uh, it means pink flower in Maldivian, and it's the name of the Maldivian national flower, um, because the color of the head of the fish, that pinkish, is the same tone of pink that the flower has. And uh, um, it got so much media traction, uh, even in the Maldives, because of the name that now uh, the Maldivian authorities are already planning to expand their marine protected areas to include some of the deep reefs to protect those deep, uh, uh, the, the, this fish that was just uh, uh, described uh, from there. And by the way, Maldives has over a thousand species of reef fish in its waters. And this is the first one to be described by a Maldivian scientist and to uh, uh, get a Maldivian name. Um, the, the other thing that we do a lot in our group is, is collaborate with local partners everywhere we go. So um, this one, uh, one of the co-authors is a Maldivian scientist that's now here in San Francisco with me doing his master's degree. He works at the Maldives Marine uh, Research Institute, which is our main partner in the Maldives. So we're doing all of the work in the Maldives with local partners. And then to raise awareness, we always share our news with the public. So it, this, this discovery has been all over the place, um, it's shared in many different uh, languages. And I, I couldn't hope for, for more, uh, for a better outcome because it's already causing a shift in, in the way that people think about those deep reefs in the Maldives, just because this new species that has a Maldivian name was, was described from their reefs. Now we keep going back to the Maldives. The Maldives is a long time uh, uh, site for us and we keep finding more new species. We just went there um, this past December. So about three, four months ago, Ooh, five months ago now. And we found more new species. This is a new species of chromis that we found in the Maldives at about 110 meters depth. But this is the most spectacular one of all. Uh, this is a, a new Sudentia, as we found there um, in the Maldives, up in about 120, about 130 meters depth. And um, this one, when, uh, when, when, when I first, so whenever we go there, we do these expeditions, we do uh, uh, talks. We, we go back to the Maldives Marine Research Institute and we talked about what our results were, what we found, what we discovered. In this case, this fish I discovered, the first time we discovered it was back in January, 2022, right in the middle of the Omicron wave of COVID. So when we came back from the boat with the results, I couldn't do a, a talk in person that I wanted to do at the Maldives Marine Research Institute, but we also, we still did a talk anyways, we did a, a Zoom talk. And um, uh, the, the director of the Marine Research Institute was on the call and the director of the Coast Guard and uh, a lot of Maldivian authorities. And um, when I showed this picture, they started talking to each other, debating what name it could get after, after the one that got the national flower, what name we're gonna give to this one. So it's like, when you see something like that, or like, okay, my work here is done. It's, it's their fish, they, they, they want to name it, they're taking ownership and I know they're going to protect it just because it's linked to the culture, it's linked to their story. So um, in the end of the day, that's uh, that's really what we want to do. We do the basic research, we do the more advanced research, the community ecology research, but what we really want to do is to, to 
inspire people to love this ecosystem and protect these, these animals as much as they can. Uh, towards that goal, if you're ever in San Francisco, we have an exhibit that's entirely devoted to this ecosystem here at the Academy. Um, we have some of the most beautiful fish in the world. This is the peppermint angelfish. Um, we collected them ourselves because they're very hard to collect, or they're very deep. They're not hard to collect when you're in the right ecosystem. They're not rare or anything, but you have to go to 120 meters depth using uh, uh, technical reef reader diving, which is not for everybody. Not everyone is trained on that. Um, and this one happens to be the most expensive marine fish in the world. A fish like this is worth $20,000 or so. And you can see one in our exhibit here uh, in the public floor. So if you ever come to San Francisco, please come see us. And you see all, not only this one, but a lot of other fish that are very unique. And um, sometimes we even exhibit live specimens of species that we haven't even named yet. So with that, I want to say that there's a large group that I, I, I have to acknowledge. And um, this is it. I'm going to open up for questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Louise. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, just this huge, you know, amazing hidden ecosystem that uh, thanks to you, we can learn more about uh, all together. It's such, such amazing diversity. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in, um, so I'm going to start to look at some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, and if you want to ask a question, please add it into the, the Q&A now. Um, so, OK, I'm going to take these a little bit just in a random order, really. So, so first of all, I've got a question from Valerie. Um, so some of these fish are so beautiful. Um, so why are fish so colourful so far below the surface of the sea? That's a good question. Um, the, the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> so the long answer is, um, it is, and this is particularly interesting because um, the lights that they reflect, so those reds, those yellows, uh, the wavelength of those lights, they don't, they're not in that ecosystem. The water, it works as a filter. So the deeper you go, uh, the the less light there is, but it's not equal. The deeper you go, only blue light penetrates. So at 120 meters, there's only blue light. There's no red lights, there's no yellow lights. So those lights are not even reflected. Um, so one of the explanations can be that they, that's the way they, they found to camouflage themselves because those lights are not there. It kind of disrupts their outline. They, um, they used as, as camouflage. Um, I don't think that's the entire explanation because uh, there's a lot of differences between male and female. So sometimes the male is much more colorful than the female. So there has to be another way. So they might be seeing the things differently. Um, we have an active line of, of study in the lab here trying to figure out if they if their vision is different, if the if those colors are associated with any fluorescence part and, uh, patterns, for example, they must they might be masking a fluorescent pigment that we can't see, but they can. So all kinds of interesting questions being asked. Nice, interesting, thank you. Um, and then a, a question here from Sergio about some of the community ecology work that you've been doing. Um, so does that mean that diversity is really linked with the shallow coral reefs and the variation Whereas at the mesophotic depths, it's just more or less the same everywhere. Um, it's yes, I think so. The diversity, well, I mean, the, the gradient of diversity is is much less apparent in the deep, especially at small spatial scales. So if you go the entire Philippines, the entire country of the Philippines, and you look at every deep reef there, yes, there's more deep reef fishes in the Philippines than there is in Hawaii. But if you get to a smaller scale, there's the same amount in one transect in the Philippines as there is in Hawaii. So there's a decoupling between the local diversity and the regional diversity. Um, in general, the more species you have in a whole region, say like a country like Brazil, there's thousands of species of birds. You go to a small patch of forest in the Amazon, there's hundreds of species of birds. If you go to another country like England, where there's not thousands of species of birds, there's only hundreds, then the, 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 the decrease, the local decrease in diversity is proportional to the regional decrease 
in the debris, the deeper you go, the less proportional that becomes. That's that's what the more interesting, uh, the most interesting observation is, is that the, the regional diversity is decoupled from the, the local diversity there. Cool, brilliant, thank you, thank you. And then we've got a few sort of similar questions about um, when you bring fish back up to the surface as, as live, live specimens. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have to do that slowly as well in order to allow for pressure? And then how do you keep those deep sea fish in tanks um, so that people can see them? Yeah. Right, right. That's a good question, too. And that's that's subject of an entire different talk, <laughs> which I have. I have it here. You want you have another hour? I can give you another hour talk. Um, I think people would actually like that. But, uh... Exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, all jokes aside, we, we developed actually a fish decompression chamber. So if a diver spends 10, 15 minutes at those depths, and for us, it's if we do a 10 minute dive to about 120 meters depth, it's five, five hour, four or five hours to come up. That's how long it takes to, to decompress. So we have to come up very slowly, but the fish spent their whole life there. So they have to come up even slower. Now it's not practical for us as a diver to hold the fish and, and, and follow the same decompression as the fish. So what we did here at the Academy is we developed a fish decompression chamber. So it's a small apparatus. I don't have any in my office here. I think the only one we have here is in the public floor, um, but, um, it's a small apparatus. It looks like a, a canister of a filter. And we put the fish in there. We seal it at under pressure. And then we send it up to the surface with the pressure sealed in there. And then um, aquarium biologists hook that up to pumps. And then they slowly decompress the fish over days. So for us, it takes a few hours. For the fish, it takes a few days. So they slowly remove the pressure from the tank. Uh, from the decompression chamber, and then that brings them safely back to the surface. Um, traditionally, when aquarium collectors collect fish, not at the same depths as we do, but that, I don't know, there's some aquarium collectors that collect fish at 50 meters depth. Even that different, that pressure variation affects the fish. So traditionally, they do it by, by puncturing the swim bladder. The biggest problem with the fish is that the swim bladder is a, is a gas bubble that as you go up, it increases in size and then it squishes all of the other organs of the fish. And you can see easily how bad that is for the fish. Now, puncturing it with, in, with a needle is also very damaging to the fish. That's why we developed the fish decompression chamber. So as after the fish is decompressed properly using the decompression chamber, then um, uh, it's, it's much easier uh, uh, to, to maintain it. And then we maintain it at, uh, under, under normal pressure. A lot of people ask us if the tanks are kept under pressure for the fish to be okay. They don't have to. So if you decompress the fish properly, they live fine at ambient pressure. What we do have to do with the tanks is we have to keep them darker and colder um, because the water temperature is much colder on these deeper reefs. And because there's a lot less light and they're much darker, then we keep the tanks darker and colder and the fish are happy with it. We have fish in our exhibit here since uh, 2016, some 15, 16, the same fish that we collected five, six, seven years ago are still alive. So they're living a long time. As long as we figure out what they like to eat um, and we keep the lights down and the temperature down, they're fine for a long time. And, and do they breed? Are you able to kind of get males and females and breeding? Or is that just, is it just too complicated? Yes. No, amazingly, yes, they do breed. There's a whole program here at the aquarium looking at uh, 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 what species are breeding and trying to raise their eggs. They breed very often, actually. What's really hard to do is to raise the eggs. So when they breed, when they spawn, they, they make a lot of eggs. And then the eggs, they turn into tiny little microscopic larvae. And those larvae, they're really hard to feed. So that's the problem to, of closing the, the, the reproductive cycle is raising the larva. If we can figure out what to feed to the larva, then we can close the cycle. And we're there's a, a group here at the aquarium actively working on that. Um, it, scientifically, I'm very interested in that too, because the larva of the fish, sometimes um, uh, scientists collect them with a, a, a plankton net, but they can't tell what they are because they look completely different from the adults. So if we can tell what they are here in the aquarium, then we can kind of do a morphological uh, 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 catalog of the larva in a way for the, the, the fish biologists to identify them just by looking at them. 
Oh, nice, nice, interesting. Um, and then we've got some questions that kind of moving on to kind of conservation um, and other issues about the sort of destructions of the reefs. So a, a question from Trevor Clark is about, um, you know, as we are looking at kind of ocean acidification and sort of climate change effects, is the effect of, of that the same in the, the deep reefs as it would be in the shallow reefs as well? Yeah, again, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short one is uh, we don't know yet because we haven't surveyed the deep reefs enough yet. There's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of te temperature data for shallow reefs. There's very, very little temperature data for deep reefs um, because there are no sensors at 100, 120 meters that are collecting long term, a series of long term temperature uh, data. We are putting them in some of our field sites, but there's not nearly not enough to have a comprehensive data set. So we know the temperature is changing. We don't know uh, uh, how extreme the change is. We know that uh, there are uh, massive bleaching events also in deeper reefs, um, but we also know that they're decoupled from what's happening in the shallow reefs. So the, the water masses, not only their temperature, are different, but also salinity and other physical uh, uh, parameters of the water. And that makes them really separate. So the shallow waters, they almost never mix with the deep waters, but that doesn't mean that the deep waters are not warming. They are warming too. And um, what, what causes the coral to bleach is not the absolute temperature, but the variation in temperature. So if the deep corals are used to a 13 degrees Celsius and it gets to 14, they also bleach. The same way that the, the shallow corals are used to 28 and it gets to 28, 29, they bleach. So it's the key there is a the variation. In a lot of the times, uh, uh, the uh, increase in temperature is different between the different water masses. So sometimes we find a, 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 a bleaching event on the, the shallow reefs. For example, like we, I showed the one in Morea, when we get to the deep reef, they're not bleaching, but other times, when we go to places and there's no sign of bleaching in the shallow reef and we get deep, there's bleaching there. So there's still a lot of research to be done to be able to understand what the impacts of those like global changes are in the deeper reefs. Um, yes, we know they are impacting them, but we don't know how much uh, and, and what the spatial scale is, if it's the same as uh, shallow reefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so um, continuing on the conservation theme, there's a couple of questions about the sort of plastics and a, a couple of comments. Mm. That just, just so sad it is to see all this plastic waste um, in these right. big regions. And um, are you able to sort of have a, any kind of idea of, of the degree of impact those plastics are having or the effect they're having on the ecosystem in these environments? Yeah, um, yes. So in shallow reefs, um most of the impact uh, from the plastics comes from uh, microplastics. They, they, they kind of function as a disease vector. So they touch one, this one coral that is diseased, the bacteria that is, or whatever pathogen is affecting that coral passes to the plastic and then the plastic floats out and touches another coral and transmits that disease. Um, in, the, in the deeper reefs, I think the biggest impact is physical destruction. Um, in general, deeper reefs, they take longer to recover. So if you break them, if we break a coral from a deep reef, it's going to take a lot longer to recover. So I think this, the physical destruction of plastics is um, that plastics cause in deep reefs is the biggest problem there. Um, what we don't know much is microplastics. Um, microplastics, we know that corals, they ingest every, every particle that they can get their hands on in the water. Um, so if they're ingesting a lot of plastic, that's probably competing with other nutritious uh, particles in the water. So for for even for room in the stomach. So we don't know how much impact in that that is having, but we do know that it's it's breaking a lot of coral, especially fishing lines and and anchor lines, and um, anything that gets caught in a current. So if it's a plastic bag that one handle of it gets caught in in a on a coral. And then the current pushes it at some point it's going to break that coral um and uh, that's that's really damaging more so for deep reefs than it is for shallow reefs and and are there any kind of regions of of deep reef that you have seen that haven't been kind of impacted when you get to them um is it quite variable or, or is it that 
you're seeing these impacts every time you visit these areas? It's it's highly variable. Um, it's usually less the further we are from people, um, but um, it's surprising how much we find even in very remote ecosystems like St. Paul's Rocks. Um, we've been to uninhabited islands in the Marshall Islands, for example, 100 miles from the first this sign of civilization, and we still find fishing lines, anchors, uh, 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 ropes, and, and things like that. Uh, it, there is an increase. The closer you are to big population centers, the closer you are to um, River mouths, rivers are, are something that collects a lot of plastic and the closer you are to a river mouth, the more plastic there is coming out of it, the more plastic there is on the reef. Um, but um, it, it's amazing how much we find even in very remote locations. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then some more about kind of slightly diving related sort of questions. Uh, one from Manuel, who is a Antarctic ichthyologist and scientific diver, ah. so slightly different environment. Um, so he was, uh, they're asking uh, about, do you feel there can be a presence of, of you as the diver in those environments? Uh, could that uh, affect the fish behavior when you're doing your transects? Um, and then the second part was, have you noticed fish spawning um, aggregations? And can you use that as a kind of measure of um, where there is more reproductive effort going on? So the, the first question, if we noticed uh, a, an impact, um, I'm sure there is an impact because we have to have lights, for example, to uh, to be able to see the fish. Um, the, the key here is that all of our transects have the same impact. So we don't use transects that were collected by a submarine, for example, uh, because a submarine would scare more fish in a different way. Um, so if we're comparing our transects with our transects, even if we affect the behavior of some of the fish, we're going to affect them equally through our transects. So we think it's it's okay to compare our transects between themselves. Um, I wouldn't compare my transects, for example, with a uh, uh, transect is a very common way of collecting ecological data. And divers do it in the shallow reef too, using scuba. So when you're using normal scuba, there's the bubbles that come out. They affect the fish in a in a much more different way than when you're using a rebreather with no bubbles. So in general, we don't compare our transects to transects uh, uh, that or fish counts that were done by divers using open circuit gear. So we just do it with our own um, our own transects to be specifically to eliminate that that bias. So yes, it affects them, but we hope that it affects them the same way every time we do it in the same way. Um, what was the second question again? The about spawning aggregations. Spawning aggregations, yes, we see them sometimes. Um, uh, we have to uh, we have to specifically go to places in general. So groupers and wrasses, they like spawning in, in points of islands uh, where there's a lot of current, so that the eggs and the larvae get carried out immediately out of the reef, outside of away, away from predators and everything. And those places usually have a lot of current, so we try to avoid diving them because of the the, the massive currents. But sometimes we do find them, and um, uh, it's spectacular. Every time we do, it's just so much fish. We just lose ourselves in it, and, uh, and we stop doing everything we're doing. We just look at it in, in amazement. Um, in, in some places, it's easier to see them than in others. In a lot of places, uh, spawning aggregations have been and are targeted by fisheries so in those places it's very hard to see them because there's very few fish we don't even recognize them as spawning aggregations but in other places like palau for example we see like massive aggregation all the time and they're really highly protected there cool. uh, thank you um and then um a question about the um helium so you you mentioned that the the helium was inert and these lower levels of kind of oxygen um, right. But kind of over long term, does this have a physiological effect? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I we don't think so. Um, uh, helium has been used in diving for 50, 60 years. It's also what people use in commercial diving. Um, uh, to go deeper than what we go, um, you need a lot more infrastructure. The only industries that can afford that are either the oil industry or the military, but they do dive uh, deeper than that. They dive to 200, 250, 300 meters depth sometimes. 
uh, with a lot more infrastructure, but they still use helium also. Um, and there hasn't been any long-term effects that was detected from it. So I hope there isn't. And it hasn't been for the past 50 or 60 years or so. <laughs> It's looking okay so far. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, a question from, from Claire um, about you mentioned the the sort of bleaching in the deeper reefs here. Mm -hmm. um, but um, with these deeper reefs, do they still have the symbiotic algae or or not? And how does bleaching differ to what it would be in the shallow reefs? They do. Some species do have the symbiotic algae. They're different species than one than the ones from the shallow reef, and they are not very deep. So we find symbiotic corals, uh, zooxanthellid corals, uh, to about 50, 70, 80 meters at the most um, when the water, the surface water is really clear. In places where the surface water is turbid, then we don't find them that deep. So it depends on how much light penetrates. And there's a fascinating thing that corals do. Um, not my specialties, uh, but I know about it because I read about it. But uh, the, the shallow water coral, the corals, they produce fluorescent pigments. In the shallow water corals, there's so much light that penetrates the water that they use the fluorescent pigments to reflect light out of their tissue to protect the, the zoncetella from too much light. In the deep corals, they orient the pigments in a different way to increase the light that the, that the zoncetella get. So it's a, it's the same pigment. They use it different. They use it basically as a sunscreen in shallow waters and as a, as a lens to increase the, how much light the the zooxanthellae get at deeper waters. It's amazing, yeah. But yes, there are some um, zooxanthellae symbiotic corals all the way down to 60, 70, 80 meters. There's algae, some species of algae also. And again, it depends on how clear the the surface water is. Deeper than that, to 100, 120 meters, then. There's a lot of gorgonians. There's a lot of non-zoxanthellae corals, uh, so corals that survive only on uh, uh, what they can get from the water. And there's a lot of sponges also that filter um, the water. Uh, but those have other kinds of diseases, not necessarily bleaching, but just other pathogens that are affecting shallow reefs are also affecting the deep, uh, deep corals. In the Caribbean, for example, there's a, a, a new pathogen that's killing a lot of corals in the Caribbean. It's, uh, the disease is called... Uh, uh stony coral loss stony, stony coral tissue loss disease st sctld and um um it's so new that we don't even all scientists that study it don't even know what what pathogen is causing it yet if it's a bacteria or a, a virus or but it's a killing over 90 95 percent of the individuals of certain species the species that are susceptible to this disease are, are having 90 95 percent mortality rate and it is affecting some of the deeper uh, reef corals also. And do and do you know how these are, arise? You know, is is this something where uh, again humans are impacting and increasing these pathogen effects? Or not sure. Um, in this particular case of the stony coral tissue loss disease, um, we don't even know what the pathogen is yet. But we do know that the disease started in Miami when they were doing a big dredging project, increasing the depth of the, of the, the channel in, uh, in uh, the cruise ship port in, the Baham in uh, Miami. Um, the disease started right there and then. Um, so it's very tempting to say that was the cause. Uh, we don't know for sure because we don't know even what the pathogen is, but there's a, a, a lot of people that think that it was because the sediment was so disturbed that it released something that was hidden deep in the sediment and uh, it started in Florida. We do know that it did start in Florida, in Miami, right when this dredging project was happening and then it spread throughout the Caribbean, just through the currents. And then every time it gets to a place, it kills 90 to 95% of the individuals of, um, I think it's about 20 species of coral that are uh, highly susceptible to it. Right, okay. So, uh, and again, again, you know what effect that will have in the sort of long term we just we simply don't know yeah um, a question about structure from david david brook um just one of our last questions now um so do the deep reefs develop first and then followed by the shallow reefs or is it the other way around um that's a good question um don't know 
um, in in a geologic time scale or in a in a in a uh, evolutionary time scale. Evolutionarily, we don't know. Um, we don't know because we're just scratching the surface now. Uh, I mean, we're naming. We're still naming these species from the deep reef, so we don't know how they relate to the shallow reef ones. We don't know if they are in the base of the, the, the evolutionary tree or in the middle or in the top. So we don't know if they're recently evolved or not. Um, it's interesting that a lot of those deep reefs are um, built on, on what used to be shallow reef. So the sea level varies a lot in, on Earth uh, due to glaciation. So when there's a, glaci a glacial period, a lot of the seawater gets captured in the glaciers, sea level drops. So if you think of the sea level 100 meters below present sea level, that's the, the coastline where a shallow reef would be growing, it would be 100 meters below sea level. When you, when you have a deglaciation and the sea level rises, all of that coral that was growing 100 meters below sea level, which was back then a, a shallow water coral, um, they drown, they die because they can't survive at those depths but they leave the structure behind. So their skeletons stay behind, the complexity stay behind. So the, the base, the structural base of the deep reef is the shallow reef in many, many places. Um, but uh, like from an evolutionary perspective, we still need uh, a lot more research done to figure out which one came first and, and, um, and cool questions like that. There's so many that are bubbling in everybody's heads. Yeah. So you're, you're not going to get bored anytime soon. You've got enough exploring to do to, to last Absolutely. several several lifetimes of researchers. Yeah. So, um, there are a few more questions, but I think we're going to have to finish um, now and, and let you go. But I just wanted to say a huge thank you um, for such a, a fascinating talk. Um, and the, the combination of everything, the, the combination of, of doing the science, you know, uh, to really understand uh, the ecology and the, the, the sort of structure of these ecosystems, but also that basic biology of starting to name those species and particularly look at how we look at decolonization when we name species um, and then how we engage with the public. So I, I really love the examples of how you were engaging with your scientists, with the public, with the local communities who were able to conserve these environments for the future. So a, a really yeah. inspirational talk. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, my pleasure. And um, yeah, if there are more questions and you want to ask me on social media, I'm active on Twitter, on Instagram, on you name it. So just go there and, and tag me and I'll try to answer the best I can. <laughs>